Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, before I start, I would like to tell you something about me. I'm Luca. I'm an Italian Android engineer. I'm currently based in London and working for Babylon Hub. And this is my Twitter handle. If, feel free to tweet at me for every question or whatever. As you would have guessed, I'm going to talk about MVI and Jetpack Compose, two kind newish things in the Android world. But first, I'd like to make some questions to the audience, um, even if I can't see anything. Uh, how many of you have heard about MVI? Well, a lot. Perfect. How many of you have tried it out and used it in production? Zero. Perfect. <laughs> how many of you have heard about Jetpack Compose? Any of you have tried it out? One of them, perfect. Any Flutter or React developer? OK, you will find some similarities. So MVI. MVI, it's an architectural pattern which allows us to consider an application as a unidirectional data flow, which has no start and can be considered as a loop. For now, let's assume that it has a point, yeah, a beginning point, the user interacting with the UI and producing intents. Those intents, through the business logic, uh, manipulates the model of our application and updates it. The updates of the model are then reflected on the view component of the application, and the view component is rendered back to the user completing the loop. So, and why are some core principles? It's unidirectional, so data always flows in one direction without going back and forward between components. This, it's immutable, so the state never changes. Every time the business logic uh, generates a new instance of the state, it's reactive. So this pattern are wait for inputs and take them in consideration. In fact, user inputs are considered part of the architecture. And it's also functional. In MVI, everything is considered to be a function, uh, which accepts as input the result of another function. As this pattern treats everything as a function, it also can be represented in this way. Uh, those functions are also meant to be pure. So we assume that there's the, the beginning point is the user interacting with the UI. But uh, that might not be the case. Uh, we could also want to perform some action based on system events, like lifecycle events in Android. That's why in our implementation of MVI, we ended up accepting something instead of UI interaction. We start with an initial state, and then any action which comes in, even lifecycle events, create new states based on, previous, on the previous one and the action itself. This is because we wanted our implementation of, our, of the MVI architecture to be usable without any UI as a headless system. Every single MVI implementation used different naming for almost the same components. In our implementation, we use those names. We have action, which are generated by the user or from the system. We have transformers, which apply the business logic of our application. We have reducers, which generate new states, and the states themselves. We also have a middleware component which work as a glue because it binds action to transformers, transformation to reducers, or action to reducers directly. That's because we, in our implementation, transformers are optionals. Uh, a basic example will be a switch. It doesn't require any additional business logic on it. So we can just map the action of the user clicking the switch to a new state. This is a, an example of our middleware code. So the, the perform action just state what's going on there. In this scenario, we see that the action of the user selecting a rating, it's reduced with a new, generating a new state by a reducer. We can also map different actions to the same transformers and to the same reducers. And as I said before, 
we can also map lifecycle events. In this example, it's the created lifecycle events of an activity. Uh, this just load the user data. So as soon as the activity starts, the, the data of the user is being loaded. So how does this MVI architecture help us? It helps us with the coupling. Well, this comes with a lot of patterns, actually, not only with MVI, but it also helps us with testing. How can it help us with testing? Well, we are able to test almost every component of our architecture in isolation without relying to the Android, in, to the Android framework. Those tests are not in the Android test folder, can be run in isolation and are really, really fast. The only part that we are relying on Android for is the view component. Those tests are named walkthrough because they represent the entire journey that the user will do in our application. These are end-to-end -end tests because they test every single component in the application, also components that we already been tested in isolation, the, previous, the two previous ones. So for the view component, we're relying on the Android framework. So we end up having activities and fragments which render the states on the screen to the user. Uh, it's usually a render function inside the activity or framework or a render class which is bundled inside the uh, activity or fragment. So this is an example. Uh, the render function usually accepts a, a, a view state, which represents the state of a, a single screen in our application. And we use the state to show or hide views. The show function, it's nothing special. And we also use this approach, referencing uh, to menu buttons, enabling or disabling them or also to show dialogues. These code examples, as you can, as you would have seen, are full of references to views and XML elements. And it also contains a little bit amount of logic, if, when, and so on. And that's a problem. It's highly, it's highly related to the Android framework and can be tested in isolation. Those the tests on views, as you know, are really slow and needs a device to run for. So one last thing before I start talking about Jetpack Compose. Uh, we are preparing our MVI library to be open source. And our implementation, it's still in beta. We're, we've been testing it in production for months now. And we went through a lot of problems which MVI comes with in the Android world. And we chose to release our work for, for you. <laughs> so Jetpack Compose. Jetpack Compose has been announced this year, 2019, at Google I.O. There was a session, Declarative UI Pattern with Android Jetpack. And they show some code examples. The website is pretty empty for now. They have two examples of code, no documentation at all. The entire documentation is inside the source code. So if you want to have a look at the documentation, you can't do it without downloading the source code. And there's a note in the website. Jetpack Compose, is a, it's in a early exploration, pre-alpha stage. Its API surfaces are not yet finalized, and it should not be used for production. But what's Jetpack Compose? Jetpack Compose, it's a UI toolkit which allows us to use declarative UI pattern. It's concise and idiomatic, thanks to the Kotlin language. And there's a podcast as well uh, in the Android developer backstage. They talk about Jetpack Compose, and they say that it wouldn't be possible to create something like this with Java, so thanks Kotlin. And Jetpack Compose, it's built on stateless or stateful components. And those components are meant to be reusable. 
Jetpack Compose, it's also compatible. And what do they mean by compatible? So they introduced an annotation, which is generate view, which was meant to be used to generate a view class from a function, a standard view like any others, which you could then end up using in your XML files or in Java and Kotlin code by getting a reference or by initializing it. This uh, annotation is not available anymore, and I guess that they warned us by saying that it's in pre-alpha. So Jetpack Compose is also unbundled from the OS. This means that the version of the UI is not bound to the version of the system anymore. So it should be easier to avoid compatibility issues between different API levels. Uh, that should help us developer a lot. So how can we try Jetpack Compose? It's not easy to do so. They made everything possible to make it really hard to do. So there's no currently a Gradle dependency to just introduce into your Gradle file, and which will allow you to use Jetpack Compose in your application. In fact, you have to set up repo, Google repo, and by following this command line, you can download the Android X master repository from, uh, you can find those lines in the website developer. And they also joke about it by suggesting you to grab a coffee because the repository is six gig of data and it takes a while to download. On top of that, if you want to use Jetpack Compose, you can't use your default installation of Android Studio. The source code comes with the bundle Android Studio version, which incorporates a plugin that enables Jetpack Compose. And it's not stable, not that much. And once you're done everything, you're free to go. This commit <laughs> has been done a month ago now, and it was meant to prepare artifacts to be available outside the Android X repository. But since then, there's no artifacts available outside the source, outside the source code. So you still have to download everything to try it out. So some code example of how Jetpack Compose will work. So there's a new function. It's set content. It's meant to be used as the previous set content view function. And it's like the coroutines launch function. It's a starting point for composable functions. It's an extension function on the activity class. And it accepts a content, which is a composable function. What it does, it, it's really simple. It retrieves the content inside the decoder view of the activity, setting content view. It actually used the old fashion set content view function. And it, exec it executes the composable function inside the view of that activity, making it the root view of that activity. But what's a composable function? Well, composable, it's actually an annotation uh, which is meant to be used on function without, with no return type. Does this annotation transform your function into a component? This is the only code example you'll find in the website. This component, it's stateless and it's pretty simple. The text function, it's also a composable function. If you go deep dive into the code, you'll see that it calls a draw function which also is a composable function. And in the end, it just paint in the canvas. This means that we end up having just one view in the entire hierarchy of the activity or fragment. And you can't uh, inspect any more any views, so there's no way to tell what's the margins, what's the padding of every single view. We ask in the Compose Slack channel if there's something, a flag like the bug pane say it's enabled. This flag is a flutter option which allows the application to draw 
on the canvas, on top of the view, also paddings, bounds. But there's nothing like it yet. Hopefully, they will provide something. So I say that the previous component was stateless. So if you want to add a state, there's several ways to do that. One of them, it's the unary plus state function. On the unary plus, uh, in the documentation, they, there's a comment which states that they're going to remove it. So if you're writing some codes from Jetpack for Jetpack Compose, which you mean to port in production, be aware of that. The state function returns a memo. A memo is an effect which positionally memoize a compute or the result of a computation. The computation, it's built initializing a state. The state, it's an annotated model class which should wrap a single value. And it's used for the unary state and unary state for effects. The model, a model annotated class should represent your application data model. The instance of this class becomes observable and every set on each property of that class triggers the invocation of a composable function, which will redraw whatever the state the model represents. This is an example of a class uh, annotated with the model annotation. So keep in mind that the observation is done on the setter met method of the variables of the class. So those needs to be variable. In this example here, we have a variable and a constant. It's done and description. So the composable function, which is drawing this class on the screen, will never change, will never be triggered again on the description part. It can only be triggered again in if the is done is changed. Be aware that hierarchy is not accepted on model annotated classes. If you try to do so, you get a compilation error. You, you can implement in interfaces. So this was the state of, the, of an example that comes with the Android resource code the day after they announced it. So there, wasn't, there was nothing like a scrolling container. So if your composable function would space more than the screen of your, of your mobile phone, you, the user wouldn't be able to scroll and see the entire screen. Uh, in this month, they did a lot of work. They introduced a vertical scroller, so now your user is able to see everything on the screen. Keep in mind that the vertical scroller component, it's not meant for high performance. And I've tried it out, it's quite fast, but they suggest you to not use as you would use a recycle view, which from what they are saying, it's not in development yet. Hopefully they will do something. So let's see how compon the, some components that they provide work. Seek bars, seek bars are really, really easy. Again, it's pretty simple. It's just called the draw composable function, and in the end, draws two rects and a, and a circle in the, on the screen. This draw function, I omitted some code. It's wrapped inside a uh, uh, gesture recognizer. Dialogues are way more complex. <laughs> this is the, the alert dialog. It, it accepts an unclosed request, several composable function. Some of them are nullable, some of them are not. And the button layout, which is a num that you can choose between showing the buttons vertically or horizontally aligned. It calls a dialog providing the old unclosed request. And I omitted the code. The dialog accept a children as a composable function. And the code I omitted there was the union of all the function you've seen. So the dialog function set up a memoization with a dialog wrapper. And on active is a lifecycle callback called after the first composition is applied 
The on dispose function, on the other hand, schedules work to be done when the effect leaves the composition. So that means that the first time this function is called, the dialog is, sh is shown. And when this dialog leaves the composition, it's been dismissed and dispose the composition. On commit, it's a life cycle called every time the composition commits. That means that every time the children function listen to a change on any uh, data, mod on any model, this on commit is recalled. So the dialog set the content every time. Ripples. So ripples are good work. They're used almost everywhere. I'm sure you know them. It's used on every single touch that happens on the screens. It set up a radius, a memoization of a radius, a state, and a transition. It then defines two functions, which are on press and on released, which updates the state. It wraps everything into a press gesture recognized and into a transition. The repo rec from state obtains the position of the, the, the gesture, set up a paint in order to draw on canvas, retrieves the radius from the state, and then draw a circle. The animation is done by the radius being updated from the model. Another big concern around the community is related to testing. Uh, they say that Jetpack Compose should be unbundled from the OS. It's not for testing. As you can see here, well, every single test in the repository is run with JUnit4, and they are using test rules to test uh, composable function. I told you that composable function doesn't have any return type, so you can't assert anything on a composable function. That's why they're using a composable a test rule and a function which is set material content and collect sizes, which execute, executes the composable function and collect the sizes of the execution of the uh, composable function and returns a size, which on, you can then assert whatever you want. So let's see how Jetpack Compose can work with an MY ar architecture. So, from what they sh they show, you can't really say if you are going to be able to introduce Jetpack Compose in a production-ready application or not. Once they're going to release it, and that's a problem. In from what I've seen e by using both of them, we can use it in two ways: an objective-oriented approach and a functional approach. So in the objective-oriented approach, we can provide an interface, which will be a base view state, which represents every single screen of our application, and provide a composable function in it, which will build the UI. So every instance of every view state you're going to have in your application will have to override this function, and will be aware of how you could actually build that particular screen to the user. So let's see how it could be used. Again, inside the on create activity, on create of the activity or fragment, we set up the business logic of our application. Right now, I'm in this code, I'm using a view model to apply the business logic. The inside the set content, you, I'm wrapping everything into a team, and then I'm rendering what the business log, the states emitted by the business logic of the application. This render function accept an observable of the view state. I'm using Rx Java, and so we set up a state by observing the observable so the view state that the business logic emits. And we build the UI. And this is all the code that your activity will need. It's pretty low amount of lines of code. Uh, 
the observe function I just showed you accept an initial state and an observable on a state. And it returns an effect of. An effect is a class that holds a block of executable code that is meant to be executed positionally in the context of a composition. Effects are equivalent to composable function which are able to return a value. So we set up a result providing a state on the initial state. Inside the onactive lifecycle, which again is called after the first composition is applied, so it's called only once, we, set, we subscribe to the observable and we update the value inside our result, which is a view state, with the new view state. Inside the on dispose, we clear the disposable and we return the view state. And this function is written once and can be used on every, from where every activity. The other approach, a functional approach, which I really like way more than the other one, will use only function. So again, from the on create of the activity, this time, as I said, we're going to use only function, so we get rid of the view model. Inside the set content, we use the post, po this function, post list screen, which accept as an input a function, which again accept as an input a function. The intents function is just a collection of all the action and intents that the user or the system are able to emit from this particular screen. The process intent accept an observable of the intent and return a, a view state. It just subscribe to the intent with an intent observer and returns a model state. A model state, once again, is an effect on our state. So again, we set up a state with a default value and the disposable in order to collect everything. Inside the Eon Active, we subscribe to our intent. We apply the business logic of our screen. So, I don't know, API calls, flat map, maps, filters, whatever. We subscribe to it and we update the value of the result. On dispose, we dispose everything in order to not leak anything and we return the, script, the view state. So this is the code that will end up being inside our activities. The intents, again, it's just a collection of all the intents. It's not that much. It's three lines, three, four lines of code. It's not that much. Post list screen, instead, it's a composable function which accept a state. It's just a simple one which goes through every single uh, possible implementation of that single view state and it uses other composable function to create the screen. So if we get rid of some noise, if we focus on this function here, the screen, post list screen, we see that just function. And if we compare with this slide, which I show you at the beginning of my talk today, we go back and change some colors, we ended up having a pure functional approach inside our views as well. This means that we ended up with only function, and those functions here, from what they said, should be unbundled from the, from the framework. So you should be we should be able to test them in isolation without activity or fragments, so maybe without emulators. And that was it for me. I have some reference. Uh, I'll publish my slides on Twitter, so don't worry. Uh, I highly recommend to give it a read on all of them, both for MVI and Jetpack Compose, if you're interested. I'd like to thank you again. And I can't see anything, but if there's questions, uh, we have a lot of time for questions.